All right, welcome everybody. Um, we'd like to take the opportunity to tell you a little bit about uh, improving open source security with reproducible builds. Um, so let's take a quick moment to introduce ourselves. Um, so this is Pierre van der Waal. Um, he's a participant at uh, RevSpace uh, and he is um, uh, mainly interested in uh, reproducible builds from the Arch Linux uh, perspective. Uh, and I myself am Arnaud Engelen. I'm uh, active at uh, Hack42 uh, and I'm coming from the JVM angle. Uh, so this talk will be a general talk, to, so not specifically for Arch or the JVM, uh, but just uh, um, uh, I think making the case that reproducible builds is a useful concept uh, to improve the security of um, uh, open source software. Uh, so this will be a, a, a dual uh, presentation. Uh, I will take care of the first part, and then Jelle will take over for the uh, second part. Uh, so this is the quick overview of the agenda. Uh, so first, uh, let's make the case of why we think this is uh, uh, needed at all. Uh, then explain uh, what reproducible is and looks like. Uh, and then go into more detail um, uh, of um, how you do it, what tools are available to you uh, to uh, improve your security with reproducible builds, um, and some um, um, current developments and future work uh, in this area. So let's start with uh, why this is important in the first place. So do let's do a sort of like lightweight risk, risk analysis. Why do we have to care about this? Uh, so, are attacks on open source software relevant in the first place? Well, spoiler alert, we of course think so. So Black Duck open sor uh, source did a Black Duck did an, uh, a survey. Unfortunately, they stopped in 2016, um, but they have some nice numbers where um, uh, most uh, yeah uh, most numbers they surveyed, and of course this is a little biased, um, but um, would say they run on open source software. Um, and as reasons for that, they cite things like the quality of the solutions, uh, features, technical capabilities, and uh, the possibility to customize and fix. So it's no longer from a cost perspective, uh, but more um, these kinds of uh, reasons to choose for open source software. Um, so well over half of companies would consider FLOS uh, options before uh, looking at proprietary alternatives. Um, a report from a little uh, uh, more back is uh, from the U.S. Department of Defense. And so these guys saw, hey, within our organization, there's an increasing amount of uh, um, use of uh, free and open source software. Uh, maybe we should look into that. Maybe we should write a report about, is this a good idea? Should we ban this? What should we do with this? Um, so the interesting results from this uh, uh, report was, um, they actually depend heavily on free software. Um, the, re um, the overwhelming uh, recommendation was not to ban free software at the Department of Defense, and actually um, invest in it, promote it internally, uh, and make use of it more effectively. Um, so I think we've come a long way, like when I started in open source 20 years ago or something, um, it was like, Pretty exciting if you saw like actual commercial products who were running Linux or using open source. It's completely the other way around now. Like all the big financial institutions, uh, big corporations, they rely heavily on open source. Um, so I think it's worth it to make sure um, that the pipeline from development of open source software to the actual uh, running of it in production uh, is also secure and no malware is inserted in that process. Okay, so this, does this actually happen? So are developers targeted um, um, to impact actually their users and their customers? Because that is what reproducible target uh, builds uh, help secure, is um, the gap between uh, the developer on one side and the person actually running the code on the other side. Well, yes, this actually happens. Um, so there was this one guy um, who took some time to look into Homebrew. Uh, so Homebrew is a package manager for macOS. Uh, it's very widely used. Um, and this guy just like, looked at the Jenkins configuration and found some keys. And so basically, he could have um, 
owned the Jenkins machines of Homebrew and basically um, took contr to take control over the macOS machines of everyone who used Homebrew. Luckily for us, in this case, he didn't, and I, he did a responsible disclosure. Uh, but this is pretty scary. Now, of course, this went well, because this was a white hat guy. Uh, but uh, even more recently, in November of last year, uh, there was a very widely used Node.js uh, package, um, which fell into the wrong hands. Uh, and there was some uh, malicious JavaScript code added to, the, um, uh, to their deployable. It was fairly hard to detect. I mean, they made some mistakes making it easier to, de uh, to detect in this case. Uh, but, but this actually went live, and actually uh, this code made it into a lot of places. So luckily for us, this, was, this malware was very targeted, so they specifically targeted one downstream application in which they injected some kind of Bitcoin wallet stealing thing. Uh, but this is really scary. Because a lot of our like critical infrastructure, uh, large organizations are relying on these kinds of libraries, and if they get malware in injected into their systems, of course there's like more ways to contain that risk, but it's very scary. <coughs> so luckily, there's a lot of things we can do to make this less scary and less prone to attacks. One thing to make clear is that I, I'm uh, talking a lot about the risks of open source software. Uh, on the other side, there's proprietary software. Um, the risks are even bigger there, because there you actually have no way at all to verify that uh, there's no malware in the binaries. Uh, in open source soft software, at least you have some chance. And uh, we will show here that there are some tools to make more, uh, to leverage that. Uh, uh, those capabilities more. <coughs> um, okay, so lo let's look at the um, uh, open source development uh, pipeline in a little bit more detail uh, to see where reproducible builds fits. So I think in like uh, a bird's eye view, the development process looks like the developer writes some code, commits it to source control, then builds and packages it, the package is distributed, and then the user runs the software. Now let's take a quick look at what can go wrong and what we can do against it. So if the developer writes code, what can go wrong? Well, the developer himself can be malicious. That's a problem. Uh, but also a non-malicious developer can be blackmailed, can be coerced, maybe by the government, maybe by some criminal organization or individual. Um, and also, he can go to a hacker conference or some other place where um, he doesn't take good care of her, his machines, and his, his machine can get compromised. So there's a very real chance that the developer gets infected. So what can we do about this? I don't think we can do a lot. But I think we can take some countermeasures so it doesn't matter that we don't fully trust the developer in this side. Because the developers commit to source control. So here's, you can, uh, the threat can be that the uh, source control hosting is compromised. But luckily, we can use signed commits. Um, in some cases, it's, it's easy to see if uh, something deeper in the commit tree was, uh, um, was changed. I'm, I'm not going to go too deep to, uh, into this. But the point is, at some point, you can do an audit of the source code, both manually and automatically. Um, and you can uh, ensure yourself that there's nothing weird in there. Now, the next step is building and packaging. Here we can have problems because our dependencies are uh, already um, uh, attacked or when our build machine is attacked. Well, when our dependencies are attacked, basically we're out of luck. So what we have to do there is we have to also verify the integrity of the dependencies we use. For the compromised build machine, that's where reproducible builds come in, comes in. So that's the area of the pipeline that reproducible builds help, helps secure. Well, then the package is distributed. That's not a really a solved problem, I think, but at least it's a well-known problem. So yeah, basically, signatures, checking, those kinds of things, we can't do a lot more. 
Yeah, it's it's a little blurred, but yes. Yeah. So recapping, developers write code committed to source control. It's built and packaged. The package is distributed. The user runs the software. Well, we can't really secure the developers, but we can check that there's no foul play um, in, the s in, in the source control tree. Then we can build and package it, and s we hope uh, reproducible builds will help here. Distribute that package and then check that the reproducible build certified package is indeed distributed to all uh, participants. Okay, so now I think, I hope I have convinced you that reproducible builds, um, uh, that the uh, open source development pipeline is something that's worth protecting and that there's a hole in the build system uh, step of the process. Uh, and that hole is what if your the machine where you're building your um, uh, uh, your artifact, what if that machine is compromised somehow, uh, then you're out of luck and then you're distributing malware uh, to your customers and to your users, and that would be bad. So we assume, so if we assume source control is okay, then the concept of reproducible builds is that we don't build and package our software once, but we uh, build it multiple times on different uh, and really different machines. Um, so a diverse set of machines. And then we check that the diverse set of machines, um, they all come to the same uh, uh, resulting artifact. So this means if one of the machines Exactly. So that doesn't solve compromised machines, but at least you can detect it if one of your machine is comp machines is compromised. Of course, if all your machines are, are compromised, you're sh still out of luck. Um, but I think this is a useful thing to check. So typically, this would be a CI machine and maybe a, some other environment like a developer machine. If those agree uh, uh, on the packaged uh, uh, result, then you have a, higher, a much higher confidence that there's no foul play injected there. Um, but, but for this to happen, so, so this sounds pretty simple and obvious, right? Um, but for this to happen, um, we need to remove unreproducibility from the build and package step. And that's the practical work that, you, that we need to do to achieve the goal of reproducible builds. Um, and uh, Yella will go into uh, some sources of unreproducibility uh, uh, in a little bit. Um, but reproducible builds, besides the, I think, the main advantage of uh, checking that none of your build machines are compromised, has some other uh, advantages. Um, so, um, in uh <coughs> uh, in one case, um, the distri uh, distribution. Uh, the the build process of a, a, an application uh, generated the key at build time. Um, and some distributions generated that key at the build server and then distributed it to all the clients. Uh, so this was obviously, obviously not what was intended um, because now everyone was sharing the same key instead of every user having the same key. Uh, and using reproducible builds, uh, uncovered this um, uh, this problem in the uh, in the packaging of this application. So here it was more of a bug in the packaging uh, than in the um, building of the software itself. Uh, but this is also part of the uh, build cycle. Um, it can also help in uh, caching. Uh, so for example, the Bazel build tool when it builds a large project, then it builds a dependency tree of all the parts of the project. And if we now, so here we have a main which depends on main.cc and an intermediate result which depends on x.cc. If we now change x.cc, but we only change the comment and we run the build tool again, then it can see that the result x is the same as last time and it doesn't have to compile main again because nothing changed, um, uh, no, nothing material changed. Um, so um, these kind of caches work much better uh, if your build is reproducible. So reproducible here really means bit per bit 
the same result. And uh, because you get bit per bit the same result, these kinds of caches uh, get much more efficient. Um, and if you set up things right, you can even use a distributed cache in your uh, organization, um, which has its own problems, but it can make things uh, a lot faster. Um, you want to pick it up for me? Okay, sure. Um, so other bugs, uh, other advantages are um, bugs found when building in different environments. For example, um, if you have uh, sorting um, on the with different locales, gives different outputs or shell specific uh, bugs. A bug we had in our uh, Pac-Man package manager is that it calculates the size of a package, but uh, the calculation method differs per file system, which introduced non-deterministic uh, packages and uncovered an actual software bug. Um, there are also builds uh, which fail, which were found which failed uh, x percent of the time, uh, like race conditions or when you run stuff. Uh, when a developer only runs it on one tra thread and you run it on four, yeah, weird things ha can happen. And um, now we're going to talk about how, in practice, uh, so this reproducible uh, build concept was started, um, uh, let me see, I believe five years or six years ago. And, well, how hard can it be to Compile software on two different machines and get the same uh, same result. Well, that's actually actually pretty pretty hard. So the first uh, time Debian attempted this, they get uh, they got 24 packages re reproducible, and um, a lot of problems um, were found, uh, which required which led to more tooling to be made. So this is where I will uh, talk about now. Um, so the most common uh, re unreproducible uh, builds are caused, for example, by uh, iterating over hashes, which is usually not uh, deterministic. So you have to sort uh, them first. Um, some, most um, compilers record the build path in your binary uh, when you, re you recreate a, b a debug build. Um, this is obviously unreproducible because my build path is Probably not uh, the same as yours. Uh, a big issue was timestamps, which were generated on build time, um, which led to uh, non-deterministic builds. Um, here for actually a specification, the source.epoch started, which um, if in a special environment a variable is set, it will replace um, the timestamp set in uh, the C header, for example, which makes uh, the build deterministic. Uh, file ordering, so for example, if you have some assets which you, you need to uh, build into your binary and you do a read here of this directory, uh, then the file ordering isn't the same on all file systems. Um, private keys were all and, and or seeds were already mentioned. And a lot of uh, binaries or uh, configuration files, they, they rely on specific user groups, um, which you might not have. Oh, yeah. Um, so here, for example, the timestamps, um, this is still an issue in uh, a lot of packages. Uh, so that's file ordering. Um, private key, which is generated on build, and another uh, fun one was an, an initialization seed, which would be the same for every package, which would, is obviously bad. Um, to help uh, detect these issues, so we have the, uh, the reproducible builds project uh, created a, lot, a set of tools. And the first one is Diffoscope, which is a diff on steroids. and it's more than your average diff tool because it can handle multiple uh, formats. So, for example, here's an example of the, the batch firmware, which runs your batch. If you compile it twice, it outputs uh, a different, uh, it records timestamp in its, in its firmware, which is unreproducible, which can be easily found with a diff, diff scope. 
because it supports a lot of files and has um, uh, some nice codes to unpack, for example, uh, an APK file um, into uh, binaries. And then it's called diff them. Uh, there's also a tool created if you want to build your software twice, which is a uh, really convenient tool. And uh, you just pass it your um, your build. Uh, so for example, repo test make, and then you have to specify the output binary, and it will run them in two different uh, uh, environments with uh, different variations, which you can specify. So build path, timestamp, uh, time zone. And it will uh, output if, if it's reproducible or not. Um, so um, when we when the reproducible build project started, uh, there was a need for a test framework, and there has been an, uh, and now a lot of distributions uh, started joining in. So um, Debian started it with it, and now also Arch, OpenSUSE, um, and even Coreboot. OpenWRT and Aftroid have started uh, getting included into this test framework. What it basically does is it runs builds twice um, on different machines with different variations. Uh, and the variations are the, the build user, the GID, UID, build path, the kernel, uh, the CPU type. And in the end, it will compare hashes and determine if the build is uh, reproducible or not. And so you can see here that the green is what is currently uh, reproducible. This is for unstable. So that is different for uh, stable because unstable has more variations in their reproducibility. And so th this environment is currently set up. There are being patches being sent upstream now all for, for several years. And I believe there was, uh, if you can see here, it was like 80%, uh, Debian was 80% reproducible. Uh, what they were uh, still were, uh, working on, um, some tool change fixes because they want to uh, remove the build path from for, uh, from being recorded uh, when creating debug binaries for GHC, for example. Um, currently, also, the, the, the Debian policy is to have, uh, you should make your package reproducible. It's not a requirement yet. So this is something they will consider in the future. Um, they're also not comparing yet the, the actual packages, which they um, put in the re repositories. This test uh, setup really just builds it twice, and it doesn't comp uh, try to rebuild a package which is currently in the repository. Uh, for example, also the Debian image is not reproducible yet uh, because of SquashFS not being uh, reprodu not being able to re recreate reproducible images. And another interesting thing is this whole reproducible concept uh, wouldn't work without a nice way to integrate it in your uh, distribution. So there needs to be some way for the um, package manager to check if a package is reproducible. And this is something which is being discussed and uh, uh, now, uh, actually last, uh, last year there was a reproducible build summit in Paris where there was talk, starting talk about how can we um, inform users that their package, which they download from, the, uh, for example, the Debian repository, hasn't been tampered on. Uh, on the build server. So that basically the, the idea is the distro builds package. We have a set of uh, trusted rebuilders, which if a, if a new package is uploaded, rebuilds the package. They um, have some sort of API where they publish their res uh, results. Um, this is integrated in your package manager. If you try to install a package and it's not reproducible, you get red flags. So for example, an example, this could be uh, how it would look like. This isn't set in stone. But. Um, apart from, uh, so the initial effort, effort with reproducible build started with making Debian uh, reproducible. And then a lot of other projects uh, joined in. Um, 
And there are also people trying to make uh, GDKs and Java environments reproducible. For example, you could argue that you want PyPy packages to be reproducible. Fdroid is working on uh, getting reproducible APKs. And um, there are there's a new project in Toto, it's been around that, which is more about uh, also securing your supply chain um, by adding um, uh, by adding um, metadata to every build step you have, and with that metadata you can verify that the build hasn't been tampered with. And another uh, initiative which started was bootstrapable builds. Um, this aims to, um, it's arguably even more insane, it uh, aims to uh, reduce the amount of binary uh, binaries you need to bootstrap, for example, a GCC compiler. Because uh, currently, if you want to build your GCC compiler, you already need a GCC compiler, but can you trust that your current GCC compiler hasn't been tampered with? This is an this is not part of the, the reproducible builds so project, but it is an, another interesting issue we uh, have in the open source world. Um, so I guess that kind of concludes it. Um, if you want to get involved, the reproducible builds website has um, talks, has uh, a lot of re uh, documentation. If you have, if you are uh, um, a developer and you want to check if your package is reproducible. Uh, it has also uh, all talks and slides where you can learn more. Um, the reproducible Twitter account where you can follow status updates every week. There's an, uh, a blog update with the current progress in various projects uh, on reproducible builds. There's on OFTC is an RC channel where you can join if you want to ha help out, have uh, questions. Or you can ask us. So, thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, so I had one question, uh, which is not entirely related to uh, reproducible builds, but more to the whole uh, risk mm -hmm. analysis at the beginning. Uh, when you set a uh, uh, full place uh, because of uh, a bad committer or whatever uh, to detect that, that you couldn't detect it at the individual committer level, but you could detect it at uh, basically the, the version control system, uh, the, the SCM uh, level. <coughs> Uh, what we see, though, is that there are a lot of projects, and especially in something like the Node.js space, NPM, where uh, uh, everyone doesn't want to reinvent the wheel, so they rather bring in a module for five lines of code than write five lines of code themselves, is that you get single maintainer projects. Uh, what about, uh, for example, LeftPod, of course, was an example of this. And in a way, the whole uh, Bitcoin heist thingy at NPM also was... And ex well, there was only one maintainer who gave up, and then someone else took over. So again, single maintainer. Uh, so what does that do to the risk analysis if you look specifically at single maintainer projects? And then, yeah. yes, good question. Um, this is a little bit outside of scope scope of reproducible build specifically, uh, but it's definitely an important uh, subject. Uh, so I think there's a number of things we can do. Um, I think better change tracking and better automated, uh, well, I, I hesitate to use the word audit, but uh, all kind of code checking uh, tools which check that there are um, no strange changes uh, and no uh, changes that appear to rewrite history. Um, on a little bit bigger skill, we need to get better at uh, transferring ownership and sharing ownership of these kinds of projects, um, which is a huge open question, I think. I mean, there's a lot of interesting initiatives in this space. Uh, there's <coughs> projects to fund these kinds of things, like Open Collective. There's a number of others which, whose names escape me right now. Um, we'll have to see how well that will work. Um, so yes, this is uh, an interesting space, definitely.
Okay, thank you. Yes? I, I don't get how the end user verification works because you were explaining that my distribution builder is doing the reproducible build part. So they have a build farm which contains of, of multiple different types of servers. They all produce the same binary. Uh, distribution maintainer signs it and then gives me the package and I go, okay, I trust my, main, my distribution provider. I don't see how tooling on my end would be able to verify the reproducible build without actually building it myself. Well, the, the thought is that um, it, it should be easy to set up an, uh, for a third party, so not uh, related to your distribution, to be able to... Um, Th third party is me, because I don't trust anyone else. Yeah, so, yeah. Because if, if I have to trust someone else, then it's basically at the same security domain as my distribution provider, which means, and, and that's exactly the guy I'm not trusting right now. Mm -hmm. So it has to be me, or I have to be able to find an external service, but we're being paranoid because it's a security domain. So it has to be me. Yeah, so for, for, for Art Linux, we definitely want it to, ma to make it, uh, want it to make it easy for a user to reproduce packages. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, that wouldn't be integrated into the package manager because the package manager part is more thought of that you have a sort of verified trust uh, third party which is independent of your distribution, which rebuilds the packages. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just another external entity I have to trust, and I already true. trust my distribution builder to not give me crap. So. <laughs> we're assuming that my distribution builder is giving me crap. So I have to go around that and then going to another third party is, is it, it doesn't fully cover the risk I, I have there. But if you look at the implication, then if I have to build my own packages anyway, mm -hmm. why do I need a distribution builder? <laughs> why can't I just take the source code and have a third party build farm that says, okay, we did like 1600 of these and then I build my own and I compare, but it, 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 I don't really see the use case, how, how verification works and, and, and how you don't end up in a scenario where it's not, well, yeah, the Dutch proverb is slager die zijn eigen vlees keurt, the butcher that, that checks his own meat. Well, because it kind of feels like that. Uh, I have yeah. something to say about it, but I think uh, your neighbor also has, so. Yes, yeah, so uh, let's say you're, you're using Debian and you're not sure, you don't trust Debian, maybe you trust, the, the thing is not about not trusting Debian, it's yeah. about trusting Debian but being afraid that someone manages to get a backdoor access to the Debian build infra and inject bad code into binaries that way. So you take a, a second, uh, well, a, a third party, not you, a third party, which you also trust, which could be, say, the Dutch government or whatever. Let's say the Dutch government hooks into this and they do their own rebuild servers. So they rebuild all the packages because you don't want every user building their own packages because, well, then installing LibreOffice takes two days. Yeah. <laughs> so let's say you trust, trust the Dutch government and they offer a service with a a public certificate and everything so you can verify you're connecting to it and then your package manager can tell you need to also uh, 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 check the package hash with that Dutch government server. So that's the whole concept that then an attacker would need to both infiltrate Debian and the Dutch government build server to be able to get bad binaries. And in the same way, they would have to infiltrate them in precisely the same way. Mm -hmm. Also, yes. Well, they would need to inject exactly the same code. Yeah. But that way you want more. You don't want just... Yes. You, you definitely want... Uh, uh, not only multiple rebuilders within, for example, the Debian organization, but also as many third-party rebuilders as you can find. Oh, okay. But those th don't need to have to, to be the same machines as the machines you will want to install things on. That's a different yeah. concern. Um, so if you trust no one, then the only thing you can do is just audit the source code yourself, all of it, yeah. and build it. Good luck. Um, right now, like the status quo without reproducible builds, is you actually trust the machine that specifically built this binary. Yeah. That's pretty bad. Uh, so reproducible builds is somewhere in the middle. Uh, and of course, uh, for end user verification, there's a web of trust kind of problem. So if there's um, someone you know who knows someone who you trust that um, is part of the rebuild pool, then something like that will have to raise your um, yeah. raise your trust at least and then making the web bigger increases the trust you have in the result of a reproducible build system exactly yes 
Um, so that's for end user verification. Of course, there's also the other ang angle is for, for Debian, or in my case, um, for the supplier of an open source Java library. Mm -hmm. um, it is in my interest that I don't, do not want to ship backdoors to my users and uh, customers. So I myself will um, use diverse machines, so my own machine, uh, Travis CI, uh, hopefully some people from the community to rebuild, to check for fall play, uh, and to increase our own um, uh, trust that our b binaries are not uh, vulnerable. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Thank Thanks. You. Anyone yeah. else? All right. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Mark.